Okay, so I'd like to start by telling everyone that uh, this meeting is being recorded. So um, if anyone is uncomfortable with that, um, please take yourself off camera and um, I think there was something from the chat that was included, if, if that's important to let me know. Um, we do uh, share the meeting minutes, and uh, I did, so now we've moved to Zoom. Um, okay, I, uh, we're sharing the meeting minutes, and I will include the notes from the chat. So if there's links in there that you see, I mean, feel free to grab whatever you want, but know that that'll also be coming back to you just as quickly as I'm able to get that to you. <laughs> Um, and if your name is not noted there uh, next, to your, next to your face, you may want to go ahead and click the three little dots that you see um, to, the, to the edge of your face. And you can, that's how you can change your name if it's just a phone number. So it looks like most of you are uh, not having that problem. So... Uh, I think everyone knows by now to mute yourself when you're not talking so dogs and kids and such aren't uh, getting in the way of someone else's discussion. Um, and then also, you know, those of you who have been with CSTF for a while know that this is, this is casual. These, we are peers helping peers and you can unmute yourself and, and chime in with a question or a comment, you know, obviously respectfully. Uh, so feel free to do that anytime. I will be monitoring the chat and incorporating questions into um, the discussion as needed, but by no means do you need me to moderate. Feel free to, you know, ask your question um, when the time's right, okay? Um, and uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. So thank you all so much for being here, um, being able to make the time and not being Zoomed out. Um, I'm going to share screens when I'm able to. And OK, I just made you a co-host, Brianna, so that when the time comes, you'll have no problem sharing your screen. But OK, right great. Now, right now, mine should be able to let you guys see. Um, do you see that first slide there? Yep. Can I get a thumbs up somewhere? Let's see. Yeah, I can see it. Thank you, thank you, because I didn't, I didn't get a thumbs up and I'm changing my gallery screen, okay. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, all right, so we, are here, we know what we're here to talk about. I've got a quick agenda to kind of keep us on track because there is a lot we're gonna um, hope to cover. So um, in Brianna's discussion, we will cover a lot about, you know, what Farmer's Fridge is doing and the challenges that they share with us today. That's gonna just flow, you know, into the way we approach those same challenges, similar related experiences and suggestions. And I'll try if it makes sense to wrap that up around four, but honestly, again, this is a continued discussion. Um, as I already mentioned once, but maybe not everyone was on it. Some of us have already toasted to Revolution Brewery and you don't have to drink alcohol to toast um, with whatever item you might wish to and to just toast us all recovering together. So that's out there, but I'm gonna, actually do a toast here at 4.30 and we're going to shift gears to really talk about recovery and resilience and um, depending on who's all on the call we've got some some topics that might be touched on then um, and then when we wrap up the meeting we're going to talk about uh, our next schedules meet scheduled meetings and topics that we've planned to cover just to make sure that we're still on base with everyone's needs so that's Kind of a long and short and i actually am right on time uh to go ahead and make uh introductions to brianna oops i have to first introduce chicago sustainability task force for those of you who aren't already members or aren't as familiar we're a group of large facility operators event organizers brands local businesses program coordinators um what unifies us is our approach to uh 
take on operational sustainability, um, promoting environment, environmental awareness in Chicago, and sharing best practices. That's really what we do and sharing challenges. Um, showcasing our programs and, and highlighting good work is, is why we come together every other month. And um, you know, we've got a growing membership. If you are a member and your, your logo's not on there, send it to me or upload it to Dropbox, whatever's easiest for you. If you haven't already filled out a member reg registration form, let me know or I might eventually catch that. Um, really, the point of registration is just to make sure that we know who you are, if there's anyone else from your organization that should be on our email list, and um, just as a tracking, a means to make sure we know who's involved. But again, you know, our, our expectations are that you come when you want to and when you can and you share as you wish. So um, the last thing on that is our website and the resources that are on there as well as the ones we share via Facebook are meant to help those outside of the group as well as each other. So always feel free to share um, directly. You can email me stuff at Brightbeat when you have a new resource you want to get out there, a PR story you're pushing, um, you know, just anything that you think might have social media value to you and others, or a resource that you want to be, um, thanks, Savitha, um, that you might want to add, up, add on. Um, you know, Chuck, when you mentioned to me this week about electronics recycling, like that's a perfect resource to add to the website if you've pinned down or when you pin down what you're doing in that respect and others. So just know that we can always enhance this to be more valuable to people who, um, who check us out online. So uh, with that, I think that's, yeah, that's my last slide. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's me, and uh, that's CSTF, and now I'd like to introduce Brianna with uh, Farmer's Fridge, who's going to give us uh, a sense of, of the organization, the business model, their approach to sustainable sourcing, and um, you know, looking at plastics and recycling needs from an actual you know, corporate perspective and looking at local challenges and opportunities uh, in that space. So I'm gonna mute myself, Brianna, and, and you can take it away. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. I will start sharing my screen. So, okay. All right, well, Great to meet everyone. Um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction to Farmer's Fridge, just in case uh, some of you are not familiar with the company. A little bit about the behind the scenes, since we originally were supposed to do a tour of our facility. So I'm actually going to kind of show you a little bit of the behind the scenes, so you can see that. Then jump into a little bit about our responsible sourcing and just our sustainability strategy in general and open it up to questions and kind of some of the questions we have, open it up to the group to see if you can help us with any of the challenges that we have, um, given that some of you have, um, it seems like some of you might have actually dealt with this before. So I just wanna make sure, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. And before I start, how many of you have know about Farmer's Fridge? or have had Farmer's Fridge. If you can just raise your hand, I can see some of you on the TV. Okay, great. So it seems like a lot of you, that's great to see that most of you have had or have been familiar with Farmer's Fridge. Oops. So before I, um, before I get started on Farmer's Fridge, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background about me. So I've been with the company now for three years, full-time for two of those years. Um, and I'm just passionate about the food value chain and kind of the positive impact that it can have in the sustainable food movement. And that's why that's kind of what led me to Farmer's Fridge. Um, so I can, I lead the sourcing strategy, our supplier quality and food ingredient programs uh, with actually Margot, who is on uh, the call as well. And I bit, have been working on this for about eight years in terms of just driving chains and delivering 
different results in multiple cultures. So there's a little bit of back background about me. And in terms of Farmer's Fridge, I wanted to talk to you about, so what we are is the goal was, we were created four years ago with the goal of providing fresh food uh, and making it more accessible. And that's why we, our CEO came up with this concept of a, what essentially looks like a vending machine. So with this, we are able to deliver fresh food in a convenient manner. Um, and I will kind of, so here's kind of the journey that you get from the, from the farm to the jar. So we partner with suppliers and farms uh, that we know and we trust. Everything is made in our facility here in Chicago. Um, it's down by Midway um, Airport. And I'll actually in the next slide give a little bit more detail about that. And all of what we bring in is we try and bring in the ingredients in their wholest form. So that means we bring in our own romaine, we make our own dressing, uh, we're pretty much making everything from scratch to really give, provide the shelf life in the jar, but also make sure that we're not adding any additives, reducing the processed foods. And we have our own network of drivers who then deliver our, our products to our fridges. Um, and then any of our unsold food is then uh, donated to the local Chicago Food Depository. Um, in the last five years, we've grown and we are now in six different markets. So predominantly in the Midwest and the Northeast, all, all of this food is coming out of Chicago. And we are in uh, the six markets. So it's Chicago, Milwaukee, Indianapolis, New Jersey, um, Philly, and New York. I think I got all of them. So I'm gonna kind of give you a look behind the scenes. And to do that, we were recently featured on a CBS um, segment. And I believe that they actually show our production facility. So I thought that would actually be a better way for all of you to see a bit about Farmer's Fridge. So I'll play that. Please let me know if you can hear me playing this. The vending machine with fresh food, isn't that an oxymoron? I think it used to be an oxymoron. I think thanks to Farmer's Fridge, it no longer is. Those meals come in ready to use recyclable jars and include a variety of salads, sandwiches, desserts, and snacks like chips and guacamole. The food is only one part of the equation. It all began with this prototype, a stripped down and souped up version of the old fashioned machine. Not an easy task to convert considering all of its moving parts. Because the whole idea was you can take this ugly old vending machine and if you really think about the customer experience, you can make it feel like something more. And so the whole idea was how do we make people feel like this is a restaurant experience. One way is with partnerships like the One for Bread with James Beard award-winning baker Greg Wade. How does the machine work? The fridge actually just keeps track of temperature, the inventory, and the way that it works is every single day we know the inventory in the fridge. And so all that food that we made, we can actually allocate most efficiently across the network every night. Isn't there a little brain inside the machine that says, ah, this salad's been in too long. Yeah, that's a huge part of what makes this possible. So if you were to find a fridge on a Sunday night, we hadn't been there yet, it actually wouldn't let you buy some of the products because they're past their prime. What? Yeah. It I'm gonna let you jump buy. ahead yes, so you can actually see the production facility. facility. Machines is done by hand. They want them at a price that diversity, it's an airport, it's a community center, anywhere where people don't have access to fresh healthy meals, and they want them at a price that they can afford. And now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Farmer's Fridge is bringing their fresh food to people's homes. There are 100 full-time employees that work here. Nothing is processed. Everything is done by hand. While real humans actually put it into the jar, and then we have a date coder, metal detection, and labeling here at the end. What's the production yield? Uh, so we'll do 20 to 25,000 units a day out of this facility. What started with just one fridge and a food court has now expanded to over 400 machines. In okay, so I hope that gives you a pretty good overview. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to just jump in and ask me. So with that overview of Farmer's Fridge, I'm now going to jump to talk about our sustainability strategy. 
So really what we're trying to do is think about how do we scale purposefully by building a systems approach that considers all of the cost and externalities. And three areas that we're focusing on are the environment, our supply chain, and having a positive health impact. So in the environment, we're really seeing how can we practice sustainable food production by making sure that we are reducing our waste and minimizing our carbon footprint. Um, in our supply chain, it's how do we promote a more equitable and sustainable supply chain by the products and the partners that we choose. And in terms of our positive health impact, so we strive to have, by, by having farmer's fridge, we actually want to have a positive health impact on our consumers, but then also in the communities. So we're looking to see how we can improve that uh, in general. So kind of, this is an overview of our current work. So in the environment side, we now have about 95% of our food packaging is recyclable. 75% um, of our production waste is diverted from landfill. And this past year, we introduced um, recycled PET. So now about 12% of our packaging is from recycled materials. Uh, we actively, we actually work with Organics, who presented last week, uh, last, last month. Um, and we've, since we were started, we've composted over 1.6 million pounds of compost. And we've recently restarted uh, being able to collect and actually like, trace the amount of recycling that we're doing um, at our production facility. So we, at each one of the fridges, you're able to return your jar and we take that back. We have someone who actually, we have a dedicated resource who goes through that, separates out what's trash because we do get a lot of people who just send us pure trash or they send us products that have too much food waste in them or food residue that we're not able to, to recycle them. So right now we're actually only able to, to, to track that we recycle 4.5% of our total packaging waste. Um, there could be a lot more that is actually recycled. We're just not able to track like when our consumers or our customers actually recycle their, their jars. So in terms of people and community, um, we are really proud to work with the Greater Chicago Food Depository and have donated over three, 300,000 meals. Additionally, we strive to work with local partners and really want to make a difference in our, the local farming community. And 32% of our food spend goes to local Midwest producers. And an integral part and the key part of our, of our sustainability footprint is the fact that our menu is plant-based. We don't have any meat product, any beef products. The only products that we do have on the menu um, are chicken, egg, turkey, and ham. And we actually, besides all of our, majority of our, of our salads and our bowls are actually all vegetarian, and we leave it up to the consumer to see if they wanna add on uh, animal proteins. And for our sourcing work, we have, this is an overview of where some of the, where, of the ingredients that we are able to really trace down to, um, down to the source and where it's grown. This is kind of an overview of where all of the products are coming from. And Stephanie, do you want me to be reading the chats or will you read that to me? Will we go through that later? If, if it's not um, disrupting to say it right now, you can attack it or you can do it at the end, whatever you prefer. I would say, well, you, you can do what you prefer. Otherwise I'll ask you at the end. Okay, I can just do it at the end. Yeah, um, that's a better idea. Stay on. Right. So kind of building on that, this is uh, on our supply chain. So this is an overview of all of the animal proteins that we use and kind of where they are in, in terms of their animal welfare guardrails. Um, so all of our chicken is good animal partnership certified, uh, level two. And I can dive into that more if anyone's not familiar with that, but essentially that means that they have access to enrichments. And for our um, pork, 47% of our spend is either certified humane or GAP, uh, Good Animal Partnership, step one. All of our turkey is certified humane or GAP, um, step one. All of our dairy, though it, it, it's, um, sorry, 89% of our dairy is local, however, 
we are not able to make any animal welfare claims on that. Um, and it's something, an area that we're working on, but given the kind of more, we just find it's been a little bit more complex to be, and uh, costly to find um, dairy that we're able to get uh, certified. And then right now, it's a, a big thing we're working on is trying to find cage-free um, eggs. Our biggest challenge, and if anyone's found something that works, is we need it to be uh, not only cage-free, but hard-boiled. And we had, we've really struggled to find that. Um, so if anyone has any tips, we'd love to hear them. And I've kind of, of the ingredients that we, the 100 ingredients that we buy, we're able to trace 42% of them to the manufacturer's name. And of that, we're able to, 29%, we're able to actually know not only the manufacturer's name, but the region it's grown. And 12% of that, we are able to track all the way down to kind of like plant level sourcing or like all the way to the farm. Last year, we did 13 supplier audits and four field tours to learn more about recycling, dairy, leafy greens, and grains. So that's kind of an overview of our sustainability strategy and our responsible sourcing. And then I wanted to jump into some of our challenges. So the two main buckets of our challenges are around packaging and waste and um, on the sourcing side. So for packaging and waste, the biggest things that we know that single-use plastics and waste disposal are going are growing environmental concern not only for consumers and our, our fridge partners and we want to be proactive about finding a solution and want to understand the potential end of life end of waste end of life waste streams and if there's any way for us to improve our sustainability footprint while also improving our profitability so some of the ideas are kind of questions i wanted to pose to the group and I'm happy to jump to answer other questions beforehand, would we'll just be if there are other uses for our compost, um, we have pretty high quality food grade compost um, and we'd love to, you know, source send it directly to a pig farm or um, be able to do something where if we were to send it to our compost to then be able to get that compost back and then maybe give it to a farm, but something where we're just where we are being able to find other uses for it. The other is, could we implement a single um, source recycling stream? Um, we have a dedicated resource who is actually taking the time. It's a pretty big investment on the companies, from the company, in my opinion. And I would love, and we, re we really don't know if that is actually paying off. I mean, we put it in the recycling bin, but we aren't actually, we don't know if it's being recycled um, or it ended up being, you know, becoming recycled PET. And we'd love to find out if there's a way or a partner we could work with who would find value in a single source recycling because we could separate our lids, which are all green. So maybe that's, we, they don't want that, but everything else is either PET or, polypropylene. Um, and I think that there could be some value in a single source of, um, of our plastic. The other thing would be great to hear if anyone knows anything about an in-house closed loop uh, or reusable system. I don't know if you, if everyone saw, but in light of COVID, our business has pivoted and with people just not congregating, we've had to move to we've actually started de delivering directly to consumers. And it's been, we've actually seen great interest, which is really exciting. So we're, we have a new aspect of our business where we're actually, people are ordering with us on a weekly basis and it's a lot of packaging. And people, we've actually gotten comments from it from different customers and it would be a great way that, you know, kind of how other companies do it. But when you, when we drop off a new, order at the same time we could pick up their old packaging and then take it back and reuse it. Uh, these are just all ideas and I'd love to find out if someone has any information on anything like this or people that we could talk to have investigated it. Um, then the other thing would be if there's any other kinds of waste that people would want like our cardboard um, 
that's another question. And then I, this was talked about last week, but just utensils in general. For the fridges, most people are on the go. And so we have to provide, at this point in time, we feel we have to provide um, single use utensils, which we know are not really um, suited to go through the recycling stream. And in that meaning that they're not being recycled. So if anyone has any kind of solutions on utensils, I would be, it would be great to hear those. So I'll jump to the other set of questions, which is around responsible sourcing. And we, we want to support and promote vibrant local and farming communities. However, we do have fixed dedicated resources. And additionally, we wanna make sure that we are having an impact in the community and that we're not just sourcing local just to say it's local. We really want to make sure that we, that we are supporting people who can, like that it really is making a difference. Um, and some of the questions we have are, how do we work better with local farmers at scale, given kind of the unpredictability and just timing of when their, their crop can be ready We've seen that, you know, this isn't going through kind of mass industrial farming. So their product specs are a little bit different than like what you always see when you work through large grower shippers. And then just some of the distribution challenges. I, we, we talk to farmers who would love to work with us, but they don't have ways to get their product to us. So if anyone has experience in that, that would be great. And the other is, if anyone knows of areas in, our, in the supply chain, um, in which it'd be most beneficial to buy from smaller local producers in terms of like the, the impact of our dollar, that the impact that of our dollar will have in the community. Um, since we really just can't afford to buy all of our, of our ingredients locally, there are certain areas where we really just be having the biggest bang for our buck. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of like the main questions and challenges that I have. And i uh, just love to open it up to the discussion. Um, I can answer kind of some of those questions that came up or if anyone has any other ones. Um, so I've listed out the questions that were asked in the chat and um, you know, we can start there. And then I think uh, we've got probably some other input from participants who are on the call um, who have expertise, especially on the local sourcing side as, as you and I had talked about. So, so Benjamin yeah. asked, if so everyone knows in case those on the phone can't see the chat benjamin crumstock asked do you think that a jar deposit refunded when you return for recycling at your sales device um, would help increase recycling rate so the, the idea of a deposit being used to incentivize consumer give back yeah great question so we've thought of that um kind of either deposit or kind of the even the opposite in that we have a, um, a loyalty program. So could you actually build points at, for every jar that you return um, and then also be able to get, be able to use those to get free farmer's fridge in the future. Um, but we just like, that's, we definitely talked about it. Some of the questions that I have on that would be, I'd wanna make sure then that we are able to to make sure that that recycling is actually getting recycled because if they're entrusting us to either recycle that jar or reuse that jar, I want to make sure that we're doing better than if they were just to use like the local recycling on the street or at their office. Um, so it would just need to, I just want to make sure we're like not greenwashing and we're actually providing a better solution, but it's a great idea. Just to piggyback off of the, so at Revolution, like we do something similar for our pallets. So we charge a deposit for wood pallets and then we pay a deposit for beverage pallets that we send back to the manufacturer. Yeah. But when it comes to this, the, the recycling aspect, so like our pack tech handles, not would probably not going to fit perfectly for what you were looking for, but we offered a discount on six packs if the customer returned their handles and then we control the recycling. So we separated ourselves and then we work with a local uh, Chicago recycler to take that, um, take that plastic. So we feel more comfortable doing that than just simply putting into the, the normal recycling stream. Because you're saying by joining all of them together, there's more value in all of the, those 
Yeah, the, our local partner prefers it that way. They can ship it. They know it's it's uh, it's of a higher quality. They're not worried about it getting spoiled with uh, other types of plastics because it's a very it's very consistent for them. Okay. So Brianna, conceptually, it's the source separating like you're talking about. You know, Chuck yeah. is bringing that all back in house so that he can sell that as a, as a single stream. And do you sell it, Chuck, or do you you do? Yeah, it's a commodity like corrugate or aluminum. Okay. Yeah, it goes up and down though. So. Yeah. <laughs> and and anyone else from the floor have any thoughts or experiences uh, related to that? Deposit the idea of a deposit or take back. Yeah, just I think it's always a challenge uh, to put that potential burden on the consumer. Um, but there's no doubt that it could potentially increase uh, the recycling rates. Um, but um, to piggyback on the commodity aspect of the plastics too, um, you hit it right on with green being less valuable, um, yeah. so the green plastic, and then the clear being more valuable. Um, I'm curious though, from, from y'all's perspective, um, what, uh, how, how often do consumers bring back or is there, a, what's the percentage do you think of, of them bringing back to the, your actual kiosk? Yeah, so that's, I had that number in our, um, which was like 4.5%. The problem right now is we've just started, we just got this person who's actually like looking at going through all of our recycling and he started right before COVID. And so all the data that I have is during COVID and like, I think we only have 30% of our fridges open so I guess it would be like 30% of uh, like, so it's actually like not that bad if like it's four or 5% out of 30% that's open. It really depends on the type of fridge. So like at O'Hare, people are not bringing it back. But at a corporate office, we actually have some offices where the bin gets so full that people will stack their recycling on the side. So it might, it might be something we could do a solution. We would, it could be fridge to, dependent on eat different types of fridges or the verticals because there are definitely places where people are going to be every day and it's not really a hassle for them to go out of the way and just drop it off. Whereas like at O'Hare, people are just not going to do that. That's, that's really interesting. I think you guys have a unique problem too, just from my consumer perspective. I love your jars. So like <laughs> I'll keep them. Yeah. So that's, that's, also great. that's great. If you want to keep right. them. That's yeah, what we totally. But it's almost, it's, it's a, it's almost a design um, it's a design question, like, cause you might be able to get more take back if the jar isn't as good. Um, right. but then, um, but then that also, you know, that brings in a whole set of other problems and questions <laughs> and, um, and then also affects the commodity price of the plastic as you bring it in. Cause it's a thinner plastic, less plastic, but, uh, just as a reflection, I mean, I love your jars. So th I, that's, that's sort of the, the interesting, uh, problem. Yeah. And on that point, you know, it's interesting, you know, in the stadium world that you call it a reusable cup, if it's like a collector's cup, you know, because it's got the date or the name of the band or the conference at, at McCormick Place or whatever, but a lot of them are recycled. So why are we spending more money on a thicker container that's being recycled or landfilled versus reused? But, but I, I also reuse them. And I think it's interesting, Brianna told me where the design came from. If you oh like. yeah, so that we they're not they're actually like off the shelf um, containers. So the larger one that you see a salad in is probably like a peanut butter container. The um, smaller, like the medium sized one, I've actually seen uh, like hair or like cosmetic um, products sold in that. And then the small one is also other types of cosmetics. So um, it's we got really lucky at the beginning that that's the, the design that we went with. Um, and it's just been great ever. It's been great ever since in terms of like consumers love it and being able to package the product um, in a way that is really durable that in for the way that we, the, the method that we sell the, the food in. Funny that um, more too durable is, is the design question, um, but it's, it's, it's a reality to ask that question. Um, so kind of to stay on the point of the package itself, first of all, did anyone have more to say on, on that question? Um, 
So uh, Savitha asked, are you looking at cleaning and reusing the packaging material instead of recycling it? Yes. Um, so we, that's definitely something that I'm really interested in, in, in learning more about. To be honest, I don't know more than that. And I know that bottlers do it. So we probably, I don't know if you're able to do it with plastic. Um, how do you make it food grade? Um, so we have a lot of questions and actually Annie, who's on this call, will be joining us this summer to kind of answer those questions. So I don't know if, if anyone here at the group has experience with that, but it's definitely something that we're interested in, especially now that we have our business model is kind of uh, diversified and we really think that we could collect more from this, this direct to consumer um, channel. Have you all been in contact with anybody from Loop? Um, that is on there, like that's kind of on our list. Uh, if anyone has a contact there, because right now we've, I know we've reached out, but it's just kind of a, a black hole on their email. <laughs> we'll connect afterward. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, um, so, um, sorry, I'm taking notes too, but I think Cindy asked two different questions that, that are different but related to exactly what we're talking about. Um, so have you looked into partnering with Ozzy, which is very cool. Um, it is, they make reusable, reusable containers and a vending machine. Um, college campuses use them. I, I, I feel like maybe uh, College of Lake County has it. Maybe Cindy can speak more on the, um, you know, college and university side about this, but it is a take back program where you receive the container and you can put it back into that container and exactly what we're talking about. It can be washed and reused. Um, what I know about them from talking at McCormick Place at a trade show with them was, you know, it's costly to empty them from the container, wash them and leave them back at the cafeteria for someone to take again. But you are the means of transportation. So, I don't know, Cindy, do you have any thoughts on how it would integrate or you're just bringing it up as a, as a wise suggestion? Um, it, it was just a thought of the, you know, the program, how it, not specifically, it just came to me today. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So um, it, goes, it goes along with the washing concept though. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't talked to them. I, I actually hadn't heard it. I think I've seen them a long time ago, but for, had for, perhaps forgotten about them, but, um, yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll add that to our list. And then kind of going off of uh, when we were talking about going direct to consumers, Cindy also asked, have you considered surveying your consumers to ask a question at the vending machine? You know, here you've got that great screen. Could you ask something like, did you recycle your container last time? Do you intend to recycle it now? Um, what happens, you know, yeah. What happens yeah. if you recycle? That's actually something we're thinking about, we, we thought about um, just recently. And we were also even thinking about kind of gauging consumer appetite for recycling and making it an honor system. Because I think, I forget who asked originally, I think it was um, Benjamin, but about like the jar deposit. And so we could, we were looking at kind of combining those and if just saying, are you planning to recycle if yes, like you get like one extra loyalty point because that takes away kind of we were able to see their interest and kind of also be able to see um, we don't have to build the infrastructure to actually verify initially if they're doing that and just check on the honor system. Um, but yeah, I think that like we need to start asking these questions because we saw with this move to direct to consumer, the number of people writing in and saying, I have 15 jars and they're like, they're like, my pantry is already full of all of farmer's fridge. I don't need any more. What can I do with all these things? And we get a, one thing that's really hard for us is because we have the recycling at our fridges, many people think already that we reuse the jars. And so we also haven't actively said we don't. And so many people return the jars because they think that we recycle, that we reuse them, which is not the case because what we say, our marketing says they're recyclable and reusable 
because we want our consumers to reuse them, but right now we can't. So I think we need to just, this is like having surveys like this and asking our consumers, I think that could be really interesting because it'd be great to actually, I love the question that you asked about like what happens to plastic when you recycle? Because I think after, we, if we could collect that, we could actually start to create like a marketing campaign and educating consumers. And if people said, they have all these things that they think happen, but then we could actually say like, well, actually this is what really happens. Um, and be able to kind of start a conversation with them. So I like that. Well, that segues perfectly into uh, the other UIC, one of the other UIC partners here on the call, and that would be Lisa. So instead of me reading exactly what you wrote, Lisa, um, maybe you want to speak up and kind of share your questions directly? <laughs> sure. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Hi. Um, so we've been doing research recently um, about plastic at UIC. And we've come to the conclusion that no plastic is really recyclable. Um, only 2% of recycle plastic gets effectively recycled. So it either ends up in incinerators, landfills, or somewhere out in the environment. Um, so I'd be reluctant to, to invest all this money into a sustainable plastic recycling system when, when it goes to the recycler, you don't know where it goes or what happens to it. Um, so I guess my first question is, have you looked at other materials um, that have a higher recyclability or re, you know, even a reusability? So I thought um, glass, which of course is expensive or aluminum or some sort of compostable material. Yeah, so a couple of things there. So first, um, when we're looking at like think, researching a closed loop system, we, one of the questions would be like, can we even do that with plastic? I'm guessing if the answer might be no, that's a, just a hypothesis. So then would we need it? My next thought would be like some kind of aluminum container. Um, in terms of glass, from what I understand from our food safety team, glass is a bit of a nightmare in our production facility because there's no way, like if a glass jar were to break on the floor, I have no way to guarantee that all the shards have been picked up. Whereas with metal, like aluminum, we send everything through a metal detector so we could set, we could make sure that the food is safe to eat. Um, so we actually like are, especially the fact that we actually, we sell everything in a vending machine. So we are also worried about things getting, could the glass could break. So glass right now is off the table for us. Um, the other thing, this is a, this is also untested, but it's kind of like a theory we all are, we have internally is that, while most of you maybe know Farmer's Fridge, we are also have to convince new customers to try a salad out of a vending machine. And the way we do that is we, like the jar is transparent, so you can, you need freshness cues, like the fact that you can see that your avocado is still green. So up until now, we've done that through transparent jars. I think some of the like far off ideas I've had would be, could we have like, glass like a google glass or like something that actually shows the products but you don't actually so you see them but you don't actually need to see them in their jar so then we could actually use maybe aluminum um another great thing would be at a certain point everyone knows farmers for you don't need you already trust us um you don't need to see the food and then the second thing is now that we have this direct to consumer people are not buying the food when they like they're not using they don't have need to see the food to buy it so we could actually do some kind of aluminum um, packaging and the last you asked about compost so I just have my doubts about compost and if it's actually like the fact that it could get is it actually getting composted um, I feel like that opens a larger can of worms so what I don't want to do is move from compost from plastic to compost and not be solving the problem. Um, if composting kind of, I think if it were to grow, but a lot of people don't have access to, to composting, so like a composting waste stream. So I think that's the bigger thing on that area for me. Yeah. Ray, can I jump in super quick? Yeah, and this is Margo from my team. Hi everyone. Um, just adding to the composting, this is something I was looking at, looking into last summer, and I think 
in addition to like consumers not necessarily having access to composting streams, we also learned that like at an industrial level, there, there's a lot of composting facilities that don't have the capacity to process the type of material that would be making compostable jars. And so it's basically like the development of compostable materials has far outpaced the development of the actual composting stream. Um, so kind of just adding on to that. And then we also get into the issue of the compostable materials are often thinner and flimsier and so aren't as like, they can't withstand the vending and transport process as much. Um, so just wanted to add in that we, <laughs> the compostable thing has been top of mind for a while, but it's a, uh, I mean, you can see there's lots of externalities and just things about the nature of what we're doing that make it tricky. So, yeah. Yeah, Margo, you were not here in April, but you're like seriously preaching to the choir or singing our same song because that was the hot topic last in April. So, um, and, and Marley made another point that an issue relating to compostable material and PSAS, PF, I never, yeah, that there's, there's reasons why that is also a challenge and, and a topic that will be revisited, but, um, but a good point to bring up. So um, if we can spend, just a answer one more question on recycling and then move on to sourcing. Um, Eileen from, uh, you're not from Republic Services, but her consulting consultancy has worked um, with Re Republic Services for years. And she had asked, what is the, and I'm sorry, Eileen, I just don't remember the name of your organization, but what is the volume of the jars that you put in the recycling is Eileen's question. What is the volume of the jars? Yeah, that you either monthly or annually that you are recycling through your hauler. Three, I have it up. Um, it looks like the ones that are coming through our facility that we're putting into recycling, it looks like just under 200 pounds a week. Yeah, I think, well, that's. Right now. Again, our data is like low because of COVID. You could probably assume that that's like 3x um, on a weekly basis. Okay. And so yeah. that, that volume of materials is, is specifically brought back by your logistic, your team, your delivery team? Yeah. They bring it back. Someone goes through it. Um, and separates it out so we could definitely like we could have we could have them screw off the lids right now we leave the lids on but i mean we could we could do different things um and i think the big th kind of what i'm forgetting what lisa said i think we know we want to move away from packaging from plastic at, at some point but i think we want to find like a medium term solution and then all our longer term solution which is not plastic um just i think it's like something that we're doing something better than we are now and then what would be the ideal state that might take more um just we have to build more capabilities in order to implement it so so before we move on eileen did you have any kind of uh follow-up question or feedback based on that answer yeah you know um just kind of just off the top of my head thinking have you looked at have you looked at any balers that have a wash system in them? No, that would be, yeah. Right, and so, so to me, and we can have a conversation about this later, but um, it, it, that would be number one is knowing your volume because then you can market your material and you can market direct to plastic recyclers. So you're not using your hauler or anything. So you're controlling the quality of your material and then you're also able to follow where it's gonna go. Yes. So, so that would be to me the best way for you to do it because I mean, if your volume is a couple hundred, I mean, right now you probably think it, it could be substantially more. You could be getting a couple tons a month, and that's and that's a decent volume for someone. So, um, something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Can so, I ask a quick follow-up question, Stephanie? Yeah, of course. Um, why is it a priority to take back the recycling from the kiosks um, when most of the locations you have would have sort of those recycling programs in order? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think we always had it. Um, I think that probably we assume that not everyone has access at the time to recycling. Um, and we want to make sure that the jars are being recycled. Yeah. But it is a good, it is a good a question to say, kind of like, or like to question our norms. And if there are, is a recycling, um, if they have recycling in their, in their building or in their, that floor, yeah. we should just not have it. I think the same question comes up around, I had mentioned utensils. Um, if we can find out which places have utensils, like have reusable, um, like kitchen, like utensils in their kitchen, just not stock utensils there and pretty much force people to use the, the reusable silverware that they actually have instead of offering a, a disposable option. But that is an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just curious because some of, I'm, this is my biased perception too, because all of the locations that I'm at are major buildings in Chicago. So whether that's, yeah. whether that's the merchandise mart, whether that's the airport, whether that's somewhere, they all have like huge sort of recycling infrastructure ready yeah. to handle that. Um, but some of those smaller locations might be a challenge where they might not have recycling. Yeah, it's a good point. Too bad um, Matt, Mark from um, the Mart isn't here yet. Uh, he was gonna try to make it, but he could speak to, that was my question for him. I wondered how many of these jars they see in their recycling because yeah. they have, a, they have a, a lot of visibility on what they recycle. I mean, it's, we took a tour, I think it was last year at Merchandise Mart and it's amazing how much they look at and recognize what's in their recycling streams. So um, it's, if, if ever you were thinking of uh, questioning the model, talking to them and maybe even auditing that as an example facility might be a, a suggestion. Okay, yeah, that's great. Okay, um, so I know Rebecca has asked another question. I, I wanna leave some, well, we'll do this quickly, but we need to move on to sourcing. So. Um, Rebecca said, since the material's plastic, better, best recycled in bulk, um, and it's high grade. So yeah, yeah. To our point, you know, the solution of putting a, a, a piece of plastic in a recycling stream to be picked up and taken to a MRF. I think everyone on this call, and it's no offense meant to anyone, but it's not the winning option right now. It's, it's our worst case scenario if we're recycling. <laughs> Anything else would be better. And thank you for Rebecca bringing that up and being straightforward about it. So, so yeah, I think you're, you're right. So, um, so moving on to, to not quite just composting, not compostable utensils, but um, Doug at Saver McCormick Place asked if you'd considered a grind to energy system, which is essential, essentially, um, you know, creates a slurry that's then taken to a uh, water treatment plant. So it's using, the, it's using the food waste as a feedstock for an anaerobic digestion system, doing something like that at your facility instead of um, your current operations. Um, yeah, I would say thus far we've considered it and haven't done any more research. Um, but it would be, again, something that I think if anyone, does anyone know, I guess like Doug, do you have any recommendations of, of a particular, where, yeah, does, the, where the, to start? Yeah, the Grind Energy is actually a brand name. If you want to contact me after the call, cause we're actually yeah. looking at expanding, um, the facility we have currently, we have one unit operating on one of our docks and we're looking at putting another one in with the idea that we'd be able to uh, solicit clean organic waste from somebody else. Um, we'd still have to figure out, you know, how, how the fees work, the tipping fees, that sort of piece on it. Uh, ideally, we'd ultimately get paid for that, not us specifically, but instead of having to pay to have things hauled, we'd get uh, compensated for, for the, the, the offset that they get for generating the gas. Do you have one now? We do. You'd be welcome to come over and have a look at it. Oh, okay. It's not very busy right now, so. <laughs> yeah. But are you, so are you, I guess like, is that, are you making money off of that or is that still something you're spending money on? We're still spending money. You still have to pay to have it hauled to uh, the digester, but okay. it's, a, it's a little bit less than what you pay for the, uh, for the, the weight when you're having it hauled. 
um, so the, the the slurry itself costs a little bit less, a few pennies. Uh, okay. And I'm guessing you probably can handle a lot more waste that way than right now we have like the two yard bins and I think at some point we're going to outgrow outgrow or just not have space for all the two yard bins. Yeah. 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 We were using similar facility originally and just uh, having open containers and this closes the, the whole thing and produces a smell and rodents, that kind of thing. So it's a pretty good system if you want to uh, contact and uh, work out a tour time for you to come over and have a look. Yeah, that would be great. Happy to do that. Thanks. Awesome. So then um, there's there's questions that help us take us to the kind of next topic. And and Kat had asked if uh, you have relationships with local farms and have you considered donating your finished compost back to them? I think you mentioned that was actually a desire of yours. Um. Yeah, so we right now don't work directly with local farms. We use Local Foods, which is a local foods distributor um, to help us kind of be the middleman. Um, we have been reaching out, actually in the last month, Margo's been doing this to local farms and we've actually had a hard time finding people who want to work with us. Um, I don't know if it's potentially because of our size. I know that CSAs have taken off, at least everyone we talked to, they said that they had more demand on their CSA. So in answer to your original question, we don't have a direct a farm that we could work with, but it is something that I would love to find a way to get that to them. Um, and then the other is local farms that have, we do need a substantial bit of volume. It's not huge. Um, but we would probably need like more than a couple cases a week of product and we just haven't been able to find someone um, who has the products we're looking for at a price that makes sense for us. Um, we understand it probably would be more than we pay on certain things depending. Um, so if anyone knows of larger farms, which is, we've actually really been struggling with that. Yeah, I, I, if I could jump in there for a moment because we yeah. deal with the same issue uh, when we're busy. The um, so we work with uh, Midwest Foods, if you yep. reach out to them, and their relationship with uh, Windy City Harvest, with all the urban gardening that they do, they buy a tremendous amount of the product that they have available, that they can't move to their own sourcing. So, uh, and their pricing is, is competitive. Um, you always pay a little bit more, I think, for some of those local products. It's hard for local farmers to, small farmers to compete with a commodity farm in California, but... Um, yeah. We pay a little bit more, but but I think it, it's uh, genuine, locally produced, and um, they're good folks to work with. Well, that couldn't be a better segue than asking Alex to unmute herself and sharing your thoughts. Alex, Thanks, pick it up. Doug. <laughs> um, no, Doug, it's, it has been um, great working with you. Yeah, I think, um, so this is something that I think a lot about as the local and sustainability coordinator at Midwest. Um, I think a lot of folks do find that challenge in trying to source direct at the volume that you're talking about. Um, and that's kind of where a partner like us can kind of like, because we do that direct grower buying can like hopefully convey that information. And I'm curious who else you work with too, because I know Local Foods is really good about the farm story and transparency and kind of carrying through the brand from the farm. Um, to the end customer and we try to do that as well but I'm wondering when you're talking about sort of that like larger scope of your sourcing if you're buying from multiple places like it, it I know it can get really complicated to trace that information so um, like what are the is that part of the challenge as well like are you able to get that information and that traceability from the folks you're working with um, it depends um, we're working with like large companies like a Cisco and then Kind of more regional players. Um, I'd say like the smaller players are able to provide the information when asked. This is a whole other topic in food supply chains, but what I find so interesting is the fact that like the farms, even those large farms in California, they know if you give them a box that they sent out, it has a lot code and they're able to tell you exactly where that was grown, when it was shipped, like down to like the small plot. However, when it gets into the, like, through the supply chain and then, like, to me, I'm not able to actually see any of that data. 
and it's that's just like one thing that I, it's, that's kind of a tangent but um it's just something that i find so interesting in the food supply chain that you're not able to always see that yeah we i marley just commented it's traceable but not transparent and i feel like we've talked about that a lot as well because um there is this element of um, for the Center for Good Food Purchasing that's working with a lot of folks um, on these different types of guidelines. And you mentioned like the challenge around animal welfare, like the challenge around like all these things that's really hard to get a sense of um, that like we're trying to work with them and in general to get feedback from folks in your position about like what could we include as a default so you're not having to ask us so that it's more transparent because we also have that information because we're buying direct from those farms. Yeah. Right. So like we have the information, it's just like not on your invoice. So kind of facilitating right. that tracking and like that information sharing throughout the supply chain, I think it's like definitely possible, but there's just challenges. It's definitely more possible too with a lot of the, you know, regional and local relationships that we have. And I thought that was an interesting challenge. Steph had sort of sent us a heads up about sort of like the cost differential and stuff like that. And I think that there, our purchasing team was pretty adamant that local sourcing can be very comparably priced. It just depends on the grower relationships that you have. And like, if you're able to really intentionally plan with folks and choose the right items that are available in the Midwest. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I think it doesn't necessarily have to always be really cost prohibitive as well to try to source locally. Um, but I think when you try to buy direct, sometimes what happens is, like you said, like farmers don't always have that distribution piece or the storage or the other additional infrastructure to be able to meet um, the need. So that's why there's kind of like these partners along the chain. Yeah. Hi, Marley, you want to? Yeah, I can chime in too. Hi, everyone. It's Marley from the Chicago Food Policy Action Council. Um, yeah, I, I think also I just want to pause and like send kudos to Farmers Bridge for 32% of your spend being local. Like that's incredible. And you should be proud of that. Um, we really are because We've worked to get that, I think, from like 15. So it's, yeah. We're yeah, that's a, that's a huge deal. So I don't want to like discount that at all because I think, um, and a lot of like our suggestions and, and our recommendations for um, the partners that we work with are probably things that you're already doing to have gotten it up to 32%. Um, but yeah, certainly like the um, Alex's comments around like farmer relationships, if you are going to do direct to farm, like as much as you can before the season starts to do forward contracting and agreements, you know, having that conversation in the winter time um, for the next season, growing season can be helpful. And then identifying with farmers where there's opportunity to use cosmetically imperfect seconds um, or products that, you know, they don't have uh, necessarily a direct consumer market for yeah. or even a market with you know a traditional retail grocer so thinking kind of creatively around what products you could capture that um, they're not uh, they may not and, and that kind of speaks to your second challenge around like what where's your most bang for your buck in supporting local food economies um, really trying to kind of figure out with them uh, what would make sense. Um, I'm really intrigued by the like lack of access to hard boiled cage free eggs. And if that's like a market opportunity for a farmer locally that we could potentially help um, develop. Uh, Cause that seems like a, a great opportunity. Um, and then I also wanted to, as far as um, finding products that meet higher animal welfare standards, working with like Farm Forward and the ASPCA, who I know are trying to create better directories of farms that could meet, um, could meet those standards. But I will also do some digging on uh, my side with the Center for Good Food Purchasing to see if we can figure out if there's any other local products that, that meet those standards that you're looking for. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I don't know why the hard boiled eggs are so hard, but yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think I also, the other thing that we, we recommend to a lot of folks as, as part of like a really core to the GFPP strategy is less meat, better meat, which is not necessarily something we can recommend for farmer's fridge because you're already doing that. Um, but certainly 
um, creative accounting where you can and thinking about like, where can you get a really high quality ingredient ingredient on the more traditional, you know, marketplace so that you can free up capital, you know, keep free up uh, costs to spend more on local products. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think everything, yeah, seasonality also just like figuring out what's going to be the cheapest and when um, and using those, you know, seasonality charts is also a really uh, good strategy. And then I guess I will tee up to, I don't know if, oh, Garrett's on the line too. Maybe I'll tee up Garrett to talk to you about um, just in terms of finding local farmers, the this project that we're yes. in the process of putting together called the Buy Fresh by Local Illinois Directory that um Garrett is involved with. Sure, thanks Marley. Uh, so my name is Garrett Peterson and um, yeah, as Marley mentioned, I am working with the Illinois Stewardship Alliance and I believe there's 11 total, 11 or 12 um, uh, total uh, partners on this project called Buy Fresh by Local Illinois. And so uh, many of you may be familiar with Buy Fresh by Local. It's a national um, campaign to connect uh, local farmers to local uh, consumers. And so for the past 12 years, the Illinois Stewardship Alliance has been um, uh, overseeing this, uh, this campaign and uh, directory of local farms, farmers markets, and local food businesses for central Illinois. And just in this past year um, and moving forward, there uh, the new initiative is to make it a statewide uh, campaign. And so just in April, um, I see Marley's putting links into the chat right now. But uh, just in April, the new uh, Buy Fresh by Local Illinois uh, website uh, kind of got soft launched uh, out, of, um, out of a need that was um, developing uh, with a lot of uh, consumers looking to source more locally. And uh, we are working really hard on making calls all throughout the, the state to connect to as many farmers as possible to get them listed into this free online directory. And then hopefully next year we'll have a print uh, directory that will be uh, broadcast around the state. Um, so I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm new to the project. It's really uh, uh, Molly Gleason with the Illinois Stewardship Alliance who's, uh, who's really uh, spearheading this project. Um, and she couldn't make it today. But I know, Marley, you've been involved, so I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add to what I mentioned. And I, I would just want to speak up and say, think about the context. You know, Farmers Fridge, what's cool when we have these meetings is Farmers Fridge is sharing their unique challenges, but they're, you know, uh, at the city colleges, John Brophy might be having this, or UIC or Saver clearly is working with Midwest Foods on buying local and, and so on with everyone on this call. So thinking not just what maybe Farmer's Fridge could do, but what do we do when we're involved in a food service operation and we want to buy fresh, buy local, but it's, you know, there's always gonna be a bottom line question and oftentimes we, you know, there's stakeholders. There's the venue and the concessionaire. There's the, you know, the, there's just all the different layers. And so how, you know, just think of that in, in terms of the way in which you can recommend how we can either get involved or stay focused on the growing version of this initiative. Can, can I say something nice about Farmer's Bridge real quick? <laughs> of course, always. It's really good. Um, we, we still have you at Malcolm X, but I think we lost some of our accounts because you guys were starting a little earlier in the day. Um, should we try to revisit that once the world opens back up? Yeah. I'm not on the sales team, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Also one of my favorite lines. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not on the sales team, but, <laughs> but I'll tell you about all the great stuff we do. I'm going to put it in the notes so it's official. <laughs> I'm glad you're taking notes, John. Do something. Where's your beer? Um, Garrett, so is, is there a way for us to loop in? Are we too early in the beta launch to be involved in Buy Fresh by Local? Uh, not at all. So I'm sorry that I was late to the call and I'm not uh, entirely sure who exactly is 
uh, on the call today, but uh, where we are in the process for the Buy Fresh by Local Illinois is, once again, the website has been launched. It's been a top launch. And so we are actively um, trying to reach out to every local farmer, farmer's market, um, local food business in the state right now and um, trying to get them listed into this directory. And um, as far as uh, support, I, I guess um, there are 12 nonprofit organizations working on doing outreach right now, but every bit helps. So if there is connectivity to, um, if, if anybody on the call today has access to farmers, to um, local food businesses, and can help in that outreach, um, that would be one way to support to support that work. And I also want to mention that um, as part of this effort, we, we have been calling farms all throughout the state. And we've been asking farmers, like, what has your been experience so far this year? And we've been getting a lot of really good feedback. Um, and, you know, it, it really depends on the farmer and the, what crops they're growing and what their sales channels are. Um, some folks are seeing higher demand than ever. Other folks uh, who have historically sold to restaurants um, are really hurting right now. And um, I know I used to manage a five acre farm um, and we sold uh, mostly direct to consumer, but do, we did have some wholesale accounts. And I know how hard it is to work um, with small uh, producers sometimes um, as far as uh, having the quantity and just being able to make those relationships. So I do want to um, I do want to say kudos to Farmers Fridge and to the other folks on the line that are really trying to make these connections and to support local farms. Thanks. I'll just I'll just to add quickly on the buy fresh by local uh, work that really the first iteration is this directory that's really geared towards. Um, consumers, folks who are like looking to buy local products that join a CSA or a farmer's market. Um, but we see, we envision that this guide, we could continue to um, kind of evolve it into a guide that could be very useful for wholesale and institutional buyers. Um, and so that is uh, really a kind of goal of the Buy Fresh by Local 2.0 vision. Um, and how we could also integrate it with GFPP and the Good Food Purchasing um, Standards, which I know I didn't explain well when I introduced myself, but um, but yeah, that you know we're working with the Center for Good Food Purchasing on on um, getting public institutions primarily, but also some private um, hospitals and higher ed institutions too in this. Uh, process of assessing their food spend and working on action planning towards um, higher uh, standards and five value categories and um, really want to make sure that like the tool like when you can identify farmers that you can also identify them by like which standards they meet and how they would improve your score um, and then of course like local for Chicago is not just Illinois and we want to shout out like there's so many incredible producers and um, value chain intermediaries in the region who are working on um, and making local food more accessible at the wholesale level um, and so like in Wisconsin there's just a ton of awesome work that um, the uh, Center for Integrated Ag Systems at UW has really been leading um, and uh, in Michigan, the Center for Regional Food Systems there is incredible. So we have like all of these great uh, folks in the region and I'll try to drop in a few more links in the chat for, for sources that they've been working on um, for, for wholesale and institutional buyers. Yeah. Cool. I'm sort of feeling like as we're all moving into doing so much online right now and, you know, we hope things change, but I think gathering these resources and sharing them on the website will be really handy rather than making those who are existing members or new members or just drop ins having to search my emails or the Dropbox to find this information. So I, I think that'll be a goal of ours, excuse me. Um, I want to move on to member updates. So I just want one last thing that Aaron Dernbaugh um, mentioned was farm logics which they are always on my mind, yet I never know 
more information. But, um, but Farm Logics, one word with an X at the end, um, is who he recommended uh, that provides traceability. Yeah. We talked with them like, I think three years ago or so, but didn't work out then. We should talk, restart yeah. that conversation. And as I always like to do when we're blessed with Aaron's presence, I'm putting him on the spot. So Aaron, why don't we alphabetically kick off updates by asking you to chime in and let us know how you are and how are things going at Loyola? Wow, uh, that was unexpected. Thanks. <laughs> uh, How's your beer? Um, uh, things are well, we're cranking along. Uh, as met some of the folks that are on here that are associated with higher education, uh, no, we have sort of a lot of contingency plans for what the fall semester might look like. Um, uh, just as it relates to this conversation, a lot less meals being served because there'll be a lot less people around in our residence halls and uh, dining halls. Um, but still trying to find ways. There's been uh, lots of good conversations about this. Hopefully you've been able to participate in them on how we can take this moment uh, to double down our sustainability commitments, um, reinforce them, uh, not let them be sort of a, you know, something optional or something that's a nice to have. But uh, I guess I'd challenge all of us to think about the role that sustainability has in managing change within your institution. And this is a time of change, unprecedented, I guess. Um, so remember that you're really good at it. Uh, we as sustainability folks are really good about thinking about options and engaging a pretty good and diverse group of stakeholders to consider the pros and cons of those options. And then being really passionate and compassionate in putting change into action. That's my, that's my comment about what I'm doing without actually saying what I'm doing. Thanks. That's awesome. You make me happy. Um, Loyola and Aaron, feel free to share in the chat or afterwards. Loyola has been doing some incredible uh, webinars. We're really bringing stakeholders from different um, areas in the city, really helping to explain, you know, the, the impact and opportunity. Um, I'll just kind of leave it there, but really intense, cool webinars. So um, there's some nice uh, partnerships between our business school and our public health school on sort of safe uh, restart. So how do we do that in a safe way with our human resources departments, with um, thinking about the public health and safety of our employees. So if you haven't seen those, I think they're probably posted generally on our website, but if you go to our business school, I know their calendar is, has a lot of good programs. And we're working on some specifically on the sustainability uh, and business interface for July. So keep your ears peeled for those. Cool, thank you. Um, speaking of uh, safe starts, unfortunately, we ran over uh, member, you know, uh, Savitha had to drop off from Navy Pier, but Savitha had brought up uh, previously um, the recommendation that Navy Pier was asking but not requiring that vendors turn off their water because they weren't, you know, in, there in the facility. And I'll add it into the chat that um, the ISTC, Deb Jacobson from ISTC wasn't able to be here, but they just released uh, recommendations. And um, Jen Hurd is on the line if she has something to say about the Illinois Department of Health's release of guidelines for when facilities are opening up, there's plumbing safety to be considerate of, and we don't need another Legionnaire's disease outbreak. So it's, it's really important. Um, so that's just a thought um, on safety. And I don't know, um, Jen, if you want to take yourself off mute, I'm not telling you you have to chime in, but um, an update from the Department of Health would be valuable if you have one. And if not, I will leave her be, but I will add that into the chat. So um, if I'm just gonna call out names, I'm not sure if Mark is Mark from um, the Merchandise Mart or not, because I can't see your last name, but- yes. Cool. If, if you're here, um, so since you're here, your name came up earlier when a question was raised about um, if or why 
the farmer's fridge collects their recyclable containers. And if um, you have any perspective being a facility that houses and goes through, you know, your tenants or, or the patrons go through a lot of these, do you, have you noticed at all um, how many of those containers end up in your stream or anything else to add about that, that material stream or others, just how are things going at the Mart as well? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that'd be a tough one to categorize. We do have some seating in the area of where the farmer's fridge um, uh, space mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, people carry, you know, take it with them. I know I have a lot in my cupboard here. <laughs> so whether it's for the uh, hard boiled egg or for the salad, I've got a ton of the containers. So um, I can't really quantify that, um, that there's like a collection area and any success with collecting containers uh, separate. I thought there was a, in, in the, in the uh, unit itself, I thought there was a place where you could actually drop it in. And I, I apologize, I missed the first half of your presentation. So I, I uh, uh, kind of getting caught up here. Yeah, no, no problem. That there is, in fact, that um, ability, and we, we kind of talked through that. But the the um, the question of if consumers, you know, it, it really kind of begs the question of consumer education around plastic recycling. Although it also begs the question of is plastic recycling reliable? So that's kind of a lot of the topic that was covered in the first hour that um, you can watch the video on when I send it to you. Um, sure. But but what is what is happening in your public space what? as you? I know that like our hauler, you know, is kind of regrouped on what it is that they're going to recycle relative to plastics, and it they kind of made it real simple. If it's got a neck, then it's going to get picked off the off the conveyor belt. So other shapes, and it's they're they're more focused on uh, cups versus containers. But um, I would have to ask them specifically if they're if they're able to, and they want it clean and dry as well. So, we're if somebody was gonna get rid of that container, and they're right at the the uh, tables that are right by the farmer's fridge, there's not a the means to clean that container to make it where it's probably acceptable. So that's a little bit of a problem. So with the mark with that market being real tight, um, there's not much tolerance for any uh, contamination. You kind of just hit it on the head that the take back program has an uh, an ability to clean maybe could, but that going through yeah, yeah. I mean, if you brought back to your office and you have a pantry, you know, sink and all that, that's easy to have it uh, dealt with. But if it's in the in a common area. Yeah. Uh, where it's convenient and somebody's going to sit there and eat, then uh, we're not necessarily set up for that. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, I'm encouraged by the 32% on local. And then I was, I'm, I was going to ask about, uh, you know, like our farmer's market, it is local farmers, but they're, they do come from other, other states in the region and make, I don't is this directory that's getting built? being funded by the state of Illinois to where it's just Illinois growers or does it, or uh, is it just, cause it, it um, I mean, if you're gonna get grapes and fresh fruit and stuff, a lot of it's coming from Michigan, right? Uh, maybe some Wisconsin, some here, uh, but does it um, love to promote the concept and, um, and love to promote you know, Illinois farmers and get them in the looped in on, on the farmers markets that we hold. Um, but I was just curious if that, if what the logic was to make it just an Illinois focused uh, directory. Um, Garrett, do you want to, or Marley, whomever might be more able to quickly answer that? Yeah, uh, it is a uh, Illinois state uh, directory. Um, and Marley, maybe you have a little bit more context as to the background behind that. Yeah, it's mostly focused on Illinois, but they're actually the initial funding for it um, 
was intended to encourage farmers that are within the Chicago food shed um, more largely to participate. I guess the, the major hurdle is that um, the way that Buy Fresh by Local directories or their equivalents have been set up in our surrounding states are state focused. So it's um, the gap is really in Illinois directory system. Um, and what we really need to do now is stitch all of these directories together so that there is a comprehensive guide for us that are focused in the center of them all. Um, but I, yes, I will follow up in the chat with a couple of other sources that, and partners that we're working with and that we, we hope to hopefully do um, some thorough outreach with so that we're all linked up and um, yeah, there, there is some, like some of our partners and like we have the, the state of Illinois, like the Department of Ag is involved and um, so that's also guiding some of the decisions by okay. how it's being developed. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I, I, I love when those kind of questions make you go, huh? Like the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition We Compost list, you can only review it by category. And it always bugs me because sometimes I don't know which category I should be looking in. And I'm, I'm on the board, I should probably, but I'm like, it's not my, but there's just these ways where if you can mesh in databases, it seems so smart and, but it sounds sometimes way easier than it is. Um, so I'm glad Mark brought that up. Uh, you know what, it's 4.32 and um, when I saw Matt raise his, his can, it, it reminded me that we are a little bit late. So I am asking um, Chuck to again, introduce himself and, say something to help us respecting the work that you do respecting farmers fridge and other small businesses bright feed i mean all of us who are really just getting through and please uh, i'd love to hear from you and we'd like to put a toast up to rev brew and all of us well i, I appreciate that stephanie uh yeah i'm chuck zadlow i'm the coo over at revolution brewing we're the largest craft brewery in illinois we're the 40th largest brewery in the United States. Uh, we're home based here in the Chicago area. Our production brewery is in Avondale and our main brew pub is in Logan Square. Uh, you know, if I was gonna say anything through this time is, uh, you know, supply chains, sustainability, all these things are important. But when you look back at your home base and where you source and who you buy from, it really does matter. And, uh, you know, we have, we had 160 employees going into uh, the current uh, situation with COVID-19. We're going to come out of this much smaller company. So uh, I know personally, I didn't think about it as much as I do, do now. But, you know, buying things on Amazon and Walmart are great. But where you guys can spend your dollar and maximize uh, locally with restaurants, uh, uh, your local grocers, farmers markets, and so forth. It really does make an impact. Uh, I know I, I buy a lot of my meat from a, uh, a farmer in Iowa that I trust that is grass-fed, grass, grass pasture-raised animals and so forth. Uh, and it's a few extra bucks, but I like to do that. But, you know, you can support the big breweries out there. You can support your local Revolution Brewery as well. Uh, there's 170 odd breweries in the Chicago area that could also use support as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a tough time for a lot of us. We we fortunately have gotten a couple two months uh, shot in the arm. We were able to qualify for the SBA PPP loans uh, and get some people back to work. But uh, yeah. That's really it. We're still keeping uh, sustainability on the forefront. I actually just updated my numbers for the Brewers Association yesterday. I'm waiting on something from our, our CO2 provider, but uh, once I'm done with that, but uh, we're also looking at other technologies to help us improve our yields, uh, which will reduce water uh, consumption overall throughout the brewery and energy. Uh, some of that we've already made some some improvements on just in it's a long story, but we've we've been able to improve yields through through some software changes in, in our current technology. So we're always uh, we're always thinking that way. Just that's it's the brewer's nature to improve their yields. So um, yeah, that's about it, Stephanie. So well, can I can we cheers to that then? 
because I want to take a sip. Unlike Brophy, I'm waiting patiently. <laughs> All right. Spindrift. We're, we're big Spindrift fans, too. So. On film. Is that anyone who can show me your face? Anyone who can, calling out five, four, three, two, one. All right. Cheers. Thank you. And, and I, I would say that it is really, it, it, it's so true in terms of thinking about where we shop and what we do and the impact of our individual actions is um, just kind of ever more top of mind. It, even my, you know, the local restaurants that I'm making a point to go to, I never thought about it as doing anyone a favor by going out to eat. Or, or even when I'm in the store, what I'm purchasing, like just, I, I think we all maybe have that in us, but it, it just seems ever more relevant right now. So it's a good reminder. Um, so thanks, Chuck. And uh, I want to kind of, you know, shut my mouth a little bit and, and just ask you guys to speak up in terms of what you're uh, challenged by and you know, kind of inspired by as we move into June, I just feel like we're hitting such a point of transition right now. I mean, obviously in the state, but questionably in the city, you know exactly what it looks like. So if you guys want to just, you know, I'm not going to take you all off mute, but I'm going to trust someone else is going to talk so I can drink my beer. Well, I'm hoping they open up the lake soon. Yeah, I agree with you there. Matt, what's going on with you? Oh, not too much here. Um, we, so I, I think like just about everyone, we're just itching to reopen as soon as we're allowed. Um, I don't have an update necessarily from the museum, but we had a really good call with the Museums and the Parks Green Committee, which is a group of us in the field and the shed and the other big uh, museums that rent their space from the park district. Um, and really the conversation focused on how do we reopen um, in a world where kind of taking food home isn't, isn't an option. You know, someone's a museum guest. Um, how do we make sure that they can have food safely and um, uh, sustainably, of course. And so a lot of the conversation was about how do we maximize our dining rooms and make sure that we're still, you know, we're not just um, relying on the packaging, but we're using the plates and the cups and the whatnot. Um, so one of the things that came up is that we could probably learn from the uh, uh, colleges and universities that are going to eventually have the same problem. So I don't know if uh, any of you guys in that realm have thought about your, your dining rooms and um, maybe tried to resist the urge to package everything. Amen, brother. You know, it's really, that's where we're at, is that the desire to use disposables is everywhere. And the idea that it's cleaner you know, is, is there and, oh, Mark's got a dog. That's cute. And so that, so how do we um, get informed to understand when that's true and when that's necessary and when it's not, you know, I think that's number one. And then number two, if, if it is, if, and when it is necessary, how do we lean on folks like Eileen and Rebecca, you know, and, and Rebecca, I believe is from, um, independent recycling services, if I'm remembering correctly, and Eileen is at the other holler, but everyone's, you know, kind of da-da-da, not saying the phrase, but we're all, uh, you know, tackling the same problems together. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be ongoing. Uh, it's messed up. Um, and then the schools, like even down to Susan, you know, even down to the elementary school and, and the high school level, you know, how everyone's looking to approach this is, is, is just as uncertain as, as, if, as if the schools are gonna be meeting in person. I feel like there's just too much unknown. Um, so again, wanting to let other people have space to talk there. Good, 
the well, good news is my commute has been excellent. <laughs> and I believe it to be going to be like that for the rest of 2020. So. Have you done anything in your house, Chuck, to optimize your efficiency or productivity? I, I, uh, I have been going to work most of the time. Uh, there was about a, a two weeks there where I worked from home, but uh, just to help my wife out more than anything. But yeah, just sort of set up in the basement and stole a monitor from work because that's the best I could do, so. Yeah. Anyone else have any good work from home tips that have helped you be productive? Or work from anywhere, I guess I should say. I just want to go back to Matt for a second. You know, I don't know who else was on the Go Green Illinois call recently, but in terms of packaging, uh, I think it started in Northbrook. The, their, their Go Green folks called around to the different restaurants and suggested that they ask the patrons if they're going home and if they actually need the cutlery. And uh, they got nice feedback. They were able to share that some restaurant tours actually called them back and said, you saved us money because we're, we're not going through this material. People don't need it, they're going home. And then a bunch of other Go Greens were gonna grab that idea and run with it. Oops. You muted at the end, Benjamin, but I like what you were saying. Well, is it the, the, a lot of other Go Greens, so Barrington, Wilmette, I think Highland Park, they were going to engage with their Chamber of Commerce and call their restaurants as well to see if they can make that impact. So it's a good, you know, reduction in waste and cost savings. I'm glad to hear you say that because the Illinois Environmental Council has a group focused on plastics that's been, you know, sort of not really needing anymore at this point, given the fact that uh, Springfield isn't isn't really covering these details, um, like policy around what you just mentioned. But to hear positive feedback and to have something documented, Benjamin, if you know, even just if, if it's Beth Drucker, I should contact, but it'd be nice to have something documented on what restaurants felt because Restaurants right now don't want to be told to do anything new, but if if they understand the composting benefits, that's some of the stuff we're talking to them about, if they can understand saving money by uh, not handing out cutlery or the value of reusable, that's all um, educational, financially beneficial, and uh, environmentally. So I'll follow up and I'll get back to you. Thank you. Um, can I give a quick sort of public service announcement please um so uh reaply is traditionally a, a like an asset management platform um and we're trying to scale reuse at large organizations um we work with a lot of the universities in chicago um and uh but some also larger organizations whether that's in pharma or tech etc we've sort of adopted our technology um to provide a marketplace for ppe um and PPE supplies. Um, we launched this with the city of Chicago last week. We just did another press conference today with the mayor. Um, and it's essentially for all small businesses in Chicago. So I don't know who that applies to here um, or who you all know, um, but it's essentially offering, um, it's, it's, it's connecting small businesses in Chicago that are manufacturing supplies to two small businesses that are uh, needing supplies in Chicago. Uh, and so this is hopefully um, gonna decrease uh, the potential burden of reopening for small businesses in Chicago by, uh, by capping the prices on these supplies so that there isn't a, a price spike as demand increases uh, upon reopen. So uh, I put that in the chat. Um, feel free to share that with whoever you all think it might apply to. Um, but uh, this is something that the city wanted to sponsor. And so we were, we're just helping them do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I look forward to talking to you guys about that soon because you know the Chicago Food Policy Action Council who, that's convened over the last two months, a lot of groups uh, around efforts and concerns and challenges and PPE needs has got, you know, kind of got to the top and remained there among economic, you know, sort of challenges. Unfortunately, most disposable, but that's, you know, it's just you know, it's necessary. <laughs> uh, Shantanu from the ISTC was unable to make it on the call, but when we all talked, I think it was in March, 
Um, there was some initiatives around reusing, um, or I'm sorry, cleaning and, and reusing PPE. And so um, I have a bird clock. I have a two, year, almost three year old. So I apologize. It's right here. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, if it can be washed and reused, and, and that's kind of like the farmer's fridge jars, it would be right. I like your smile associated with that. Um, so, so I, I don't want to stop anyone from talking or not talking, but I do want to share my screen again and take a few minutes. It relates to everybody, um, to look at what we're planning to talk about in upcoming meetings to make sure we're on the same page in terms of what's important. Can you guys see this, this slide that says 2020 meetings? Okay. So as it's scheduled now, sorry, there it is. As it's scheduled now, we are, the July 23rd originally was going to be a, a tour um, that Dean, who's no longer on the phone, but MWRD was planning to host us on a riverboat tour. And we're not planning on doing that. Um, but the topic to be covered was not only the resource of water in Chicago, but efficiency and conservation had a more widespread. Um, and then in September, I had spoken with Gary Cooper, for also from Reapley, who um, we've wanted to bring in um, since Cook County. Uh, Chris Lippman had, had met you guys and suggested that we learn a little bit more about your work in circular economy and um, asset management, which aligns actually on the food system side with some other efforts. So food donation and asset mapping of who's got cold storage, who's got surplus ingredients, you know, this, this topic keeps coming up and it's not industry specific. It is like community. It is world, you know, um, uh, applicable. So those are the, the kind of two topics we had on our list. And July and September aren't necessarily when they had to happen. Again, I just explained why we had picked the other one for July. Um, and before we talk about what we should do next, the other topics that were discussed were, um, you know, September Live Nation had offered to host our forum. We, we had the first one at Department of Aviation in 2015, where it's us and those that help us do what we do, our partners and collaborators, to all come together. And it's, it's networking as well as it is presentations to help us all just, you know, kind of learn more and engage more in person. Again, not, <laughs> not happening for the time being. Um, and then measuring our carbon footprint and the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Those were the topics that you guys or others, uh, other members had said last November we wanted to keep on our radar for this year. So my question is, what's not on that list, number one, in terms of topics you think are important to you right now and would be worth having um, you know, a, a meeting around? If anyone has a thought. It's okay. If you think of something, let me know. Um, meanwhile, I uh, want to ask in terms of what we had scheduled or, you know, uh, tentatively in July and September, if one is more important than the other, um, because again, our July plan was around water and MWRD, I'm, I'm sure, and Chuck, we've talked about, and uh, so sorry, MWRD, if we were still to go this route in July, um, conversations with SAVER and this grind to energy system, water treatment plants, uh, breweries, and their wastewater. So opportunities around water and, um, and the nutrients in it, and then also impact on soil. Like all these things are kind of integrated and I could see that being a topic, kind of water and soil, um, as well as anything else anyone throws at me being the topic in July if no one speaks up. Um, and then September being uh, Reapley, 
wherever you're at at the moment and whatever our thoughts are at the moment around asset mapping um, could be the topic in September. Does anyone uh, see a need to change that or other ideas and suggestions on who we might want to invite to participate in those conversations? Please speak up. I think maybe we should meet at the beach. I don't know if I want to see you in a bikini. <laughs> uh, maybe we could do the fun at the beach, but um, or on the lakefront trail. I don't know if we've ever talked about transportation, but it could be an interesting time while we're all um, sort of rethinking our relationship with getting to work, being at work, telepresence, um, to have that conversation about traffic and emissions and how our people get to our institutions. That's a great point, Matt. It would at uh, MWRD uh, discussion also include uh, Lake Michigan and forecasts with um, Lake Michigan. Well, tell me what you're thinking, Mark. As far well, as I, mean, it, I think they couldn't reverse the river you know, like when they probably would have liked to because the lake's so darn high. Is there, is there um, any, any discussion relative to how long is the lake going to stay high and how that's obviously there's impact on the lake all over the place, but as far as uh, how Chicago land's got to re rethink. I know MWRD with the deep tunnel was also looking at all right we still gotta focus locally with storage locally at houses and you know not try to delay it from getting into their system um, but, so i don't know is there do we know if nwrd was gonna be able to shed any light on what's working with the with the great lakes yeah i think it's a great point um I'd love to ask them to. And, you know, it makes me think about um, the next slide here mentions upcoming events. Um, you see here, there's a circular, eh, circular economy, it must be the beer, webinar that's being led by the Solid Waste Agency of Lake County and the Great Lakes Regional Council. It's happening June 18th. And I'll be sharing information on that. But it makes me think that we've talked to um, Alliance for the Great Lakes, um, Shed Aquarium has been involved in our conversations and hosted us before. There's a lot of interest in what you just mentioned. Um, I don't know, Matt, just being part of the museum campus, if you have anything else to add or, or thoughts on what me, we might want to tee up in that conversation. You, you could tell me now or you could tell me later. You could tell me later. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, um, but thank you for that, Mark. And so then we, we've kind of confirmed that there is interest on the MWRD uh, and, and topic of water and transportation. I'm not sure exactly when it's gonna fit in, but I love it. Um, any other, uh, I guess I'm just gonna keep that for July and then we can always talk about more as more happens. Um, so, just to Mark's point, this was the third May in a row that's the wettest in Chicago history. And um, they, did, they did reverse the river at least once. I, I think it might have been a, a fairly large event uh, during May of this year, like, like it has been for the last three years. Uh, one of the things I noticed, though, because we had no lifeguards, there was no flag up at Tui Beach to indicate whether the water had bacteria in it to any degree. On Memorial Day weekend, if anybody knows the mayor right now, that's a pretty big fail to not know whether the the water's got bacteria in it, um, especially considering the release happened maybe like a day before, maybe two days before that weekend. Totally true. Nobody's supposed to be at the beach, but even when even when there's no swimming after hours, you still know whether the water quality is good. So, something to consider. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. That water ends up in people's basements. I mean, my synagogue's basement. That's that's really important to know. My house's basement. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we had it. It was gross. I mean, it's in its, its backflow, but we're assuming it's mostly river, but I mean, not river, excuse me, mostly rain, but you never know. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, thank you. Any other thoughts on who uh, we might want? Well, send me information if you're, if you're thinking about July, that's what we're going to cover. Um, and September, we're going to keep it as is. Uh, depending on how things go, we've been invited to UIC for more of a, you know, kind of that, that networking, but not uh, formal presentations in the fall if things go well. And um, Sandrine had planned to be on the call, wasn't able to make it. But, um, you know, I don't know that CPS will be hosting in person, but um, we can look forward to future feedback from CPS after the school year starts, as well as, you um, us talking about next year, you know, later, later on. So now I want to quickly move to just anything that's coming up that you want to share. Um, and then I'm sharing just three things that I'll send out. The Illinois Environmental Council today just restarted their Lunch and Learn series. So I'll send a link. I didn't put it in the chat and I'm not going to because we're about to wrap up, but um, I'll send it out. And you know, they're cool and they're also uh, stored or archived so you can check it out. You just need to register. Um, the June 3rd of next week, uh, Green Sports Alliance and the World Wildlife Fund is doing a webinar on food waste that is, uh, I think, um, Washington Nationals and I'm forgetting right now who the other participant is, but large scale, like those of us dealing with stadiums and museums and universities, kind of talking about that level of waste, which you know may or not be may or may not be a big concern <laughs> this fall. Hard to say, but that's coming up. Um, and then the those of us who were on the April call, there's been. Benjamin could tell, say more than I, how active the discussion and concerns are around compostable serveware, their processing, you know, just what makes sense for us to buy and us to expect from our processors. And this is a national issue. And the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition has agreed to kind of take the lead on the conversation. Um, and Benjamin leads the uh, committee at the IFSC that, that focuses on marketing the end product of compost, because ultimately, if compostable serveware isn't doing its job of breaking down in whatever the local infrastructure is, then our compost is gonna suck, and then no one's gonna wanna buy it. So, you know, and, and so on. So we're working on that, and we will inform all of you when those next round of uh, a call comes, because it's just on everyone's mind. So. Um, that's really it on the resources that I had to share and the events that I had coming up. Is there anything else someone wants to shout out about right now on your Are end? Are you going to send an email, Stephanie, about those? Okay. I will, like tonight or tomorrow, because that's, a lot of it's time sensitive. It might not be with my minutes. I will. Yeah, sorry. I'll go back to that, that slide. I will. Um, does anyone else have anything you want to tell us all about so that we can put it on our calendars? All right, no worries if you don't. So um, my final plug, I just have it there for you to see a reminder of our website on Facebook and LinkedIn. We've got followers that you guys don't all know, um, but it's, it's interesting what's happening on, like I swear I go to Facebook for relations to Chicago Sustainability Task Force and the Avondale Gardening Alliance. <laughs> More than I ever even look at my own feed because I think the feeds are so weird. Like, I don't want to know what my high school friends are doing. I'd rather actually know what's like going on in the world. So, um, but, but CSTF has been, um, yeah, just there, there's, there's opportunity to post things that people follow and pay attention to. So you're welcome to send me anything you want to be shared there. And um, email eco at Brightbeat, or if you all know my email address, Steph at Brightbeat, you know, just kind of here to help. So. Um, we are just right on time here. I'd love to just thank you all for being here. Um, it just means a lot to make the connection and to see your faces and know we're all still making it happen. Cubs fans, White Sox fans, whoever you are, we're all in it together. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, I couldn't help it. Um, there go, Sox. <laughs> I wish we could say that. Does any, what's happening with MLB? Do we, are we going to see them? 
Uh, I think they were supposed to take a vote it's any day here now to figure out if they're gonna yeah. carry on. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens. The, the Green Sports Alliance might speak to it given that um, they're involved and, and uh, the, the Washington Nationals will be on that call. So here's hoping. All right, well, I hope to see you all July 23rd, if not sooner. And thanks again for being here. I'll send this information out as soon as I can. And uh, any questions, anytime, let me know. Okay, cheers, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for the everyone. presentation. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Right, thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Nice to see you, Marley. Thank you. See you tomorrow, probably. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> see ya. I'll be there. <laughs> Bye.